Beyond, and hello everyone. My name is Jonathan Dornbush, and this is Podcast Beyond, IGN's weekly PlayStation show. Welcome. We're not messing around this week. We're in it. <laughs> We're going for it. The PlayStation is happening. But before we get to the PlayStation, actually, I wanted to wish everyone a very happy Umbrella Day as this comes out, because we were talking a little bit before the show about weird holidays, and February 10th, the day the show airs, is Umbrella Day. That's so what? dumb. You know, living outside of the United States, I never heard of any of these dumb holidays. Moving <laughs> over here, everything is a day. I like Umbrella Day is the least surprising. Is, did well, the Resident Evil Twitter do anything to celebrate or no? Uh, they actually added two feet to her height, the tall vampire Ooh, lady. Oh, beautiful. And it's a yeah. whole umbrella she's holding up there, like a big scary. Yeah, a scary parasol, Mary they called it, but you know. The, the trick about America is that we get less actual holidays uh, and vacation days and sick days and pretty much any other established country. But what we do get is millions of fabricated nonsense holidays to enjoy at work. Hey everybody, it's September sure. 17th. It's time for Talk Like a Pirate Day. <laughs> Honestly, I'm surprised there hasn't been like a PlayStation Day that they've tried to really make happen every year. Um, mm. But but of course, the day we are recording. Uh, also, by the way, I'm joined this week by Brian Altano, Max. Hello. Hello. Hey. And Lucy O'Brien. Hi. Uh, thank you all for joining me. I did just want to mention, because Brian, you were talking about how uh, days can, it'd be funny if there were days that conflict. National Pizza Day is also Toothache Day. Which like yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's had, a soft it's a soft food, so I guess you're yeah, okay. it shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, Wait, I'm I thought we we only celebrated like important things or like like important causes like cancer research or like fun things. I didn't like. What do you do on toothache day? What are you raising so awareness of cavities? Right. What yeah, about like I, this Thursday? We've got don't cry over spilled milk day. Okay, so like it's what, just what, we have a bunch of minor inconvenience days too. Yeah. Like that's stupid. What calendar are you looking at? I just went to HolidayInsights.com. They're not a sponsor of the show. I just want to make that clear. Um, keep, keep in mind that Friday is National Cupcake Day and also National Stub Your Toe Day. So try to do both at the same time. Yeah. It's, Stupid. <laughs> it, it's wonderful. Uh, of course, if you're if you're coming to Podcast Beyond for your uh, weekly dose of uh, holiday calendar facts, congratulations. You picked a good episode to join in on. Uh, but of course, we are going to talk a bit about uh, things in the world of PlayStation and gaming this week. Uh, the, the the one thing I want to start off with, though, was we got a couple of emails since we've been talking a bit about Resident Evil in the past few weeks. Uh, we got some emails specifically about Resident Evil 4. Obviously, there are uh, several big fans of RE4 on this show. And uh, the first of two emails I want to read, because uh, they give us sort of two sides of the coin of what, what uh, our, Im our impact has been. Uh, Tanner wrote in to Beyond at IGN.com and said, Beyond, I listened to the recent Beyond podcast when Brian recommended RE4. I believe this was when I was asking if you should play it before a Village comes out. It just happened to be on Switch, so I bought it. I have never played any Resident Evil before, besides the first 30 minutes of RE7 on PSVR. I, it scared the piss out of me, so I never picked it back up. <laughs> and I know that scared the piss out of someone is a, a phrase, but I really just like to imagine it's literal. Uh, anyway, yeah, so uh, far, by the way, Sunday is National Scare the Piss Out of Someone Day. So. <laughs> so enjoy your VR games. Um, anyway, so far in RE4, I've been struggling to get down the controls a bit. Looking anywhere but straight ahead seems to be tricky. Anyway, could Brian or anyone else uh, give me some tips before I jump too far in? Should I be saving my money for anything? Visit any secret spots? Any tips would be awesome. Thanks for your advice. Yeah, so uh, my my big quick pointers are, first of all, the camera is sort of uh, designed to keep it so that you only are sort of looking down a corridor. It is... Uh, basically designed to make you feel a little bit claustrophobic. That said, um, what you want to practice is your quick turn, which is down and B at the same time, flick those and you can turn around behind you. Uh, the, a lot of like old Resident Evil games didn't really have that level of dynamic movement. Next, um, you get a gun early on. Don't spend a lot of money upgrading it. When you go into the second area, you'll see these blue floating medallions. Shoot 10 out of 15 of them and the merchant will give you a better gun, which uh, I suggest riding through for the rest of the game. Put your points into that another trick uh if you are going to upgrade your weapons don't reload them before you do that because you basically get a free reload when you upgrade your capacity outside of that little things like don't sell all of your treasures immediately play around in your sub menu to see how many of them uh sort of collaborate with each other so sometimes you'll find like a gold cat missing its eyes you can put some gems in those holes and make a little more money the merchant Brian, loves that what if i find a golden chicken egg what on earth should i do with it well max you can either sell it or eat it 
Cool. Additionally, I suggest you shoot the knees with just a quick tap of the button, run up and melee your opponents. You will save a lot of ammo doing that. Once they're on the ground, start knife slashing them like crazy and pick up everything you can. That gets harder later in the game when like creepy crawly uh, snake <laughs> starts popping out of their heads. So just a heads up. Um, now, Brian, but yeah, just I've enjoy the ride. Before, and I can't keep track of all these different colored herbs. What do these mean? Well, Max, actually, that's a really good question. I suggest that when you find a yellow one, you hold on to it forever. Combine it with a red one and a green one. Eat those all in one hot tube and your health will permanently move up a tick throughout the rest of the game. Uh, you can actually do that until you see Leon's health move past uh, the basic parameter you see, which is about three fourths of a quarter until it fully completes a circle. Um, you can also give those to Ashley, uh, who you will be babysitting through the second half of the game, and uh, you'll do pretty well. By the way, if you beat Assignment Ada, which comes with uh, the main game, uh, you unlock a suit of armor for Ashley that she can wear forever. And if you go professional mode after beating Ada, everyone in the game will try to pick her up, but they can't because she's too heavy. So they'll fall on their weird asses and then you can go over and knife them and kill them. It's a I, really good game. I love I it. I just have one point of clarification. I Maybe this is just my misunderstanding or ignorance of the franchise. Mm -hmm. the, the herbs go into tubes? Because I always imagine they're just kind of holding like a loose like you know bunch of herbs in their pocket and then well the like, like they just like shoved it like a mouth. like a lot of the marijuana culture over the last 20 years it has become more sophisticated i would say of course. um whereas it did start with sort of like loosely rolled joints and paraphernalia that you would find in creaky old houses it is now upgraded to uh i would say a lot of those like tubes that you used to put in the bank to put money in when you were in your car um but yeah, or, you know, delivery. So basically, like, yeah, you get all those things together, roll them up and eat them. Otherwise, it's just some loose herbs that you can eat. I like to think that Leon's like toting around a little umbrella core grinder. You know, he <laughs> plants. He's like, oh, time to pack these down. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Um, just to continue the, the Resident Evil 4 love, uh, we got another email from Ulysses who wrote in, thanks to Brian, I love RE4. Uh, it's a little bit of a memory card, but you know, why not? Uh, we'll start the show with it. Uh, hey, Beyond Crew, long time, first time. With all the talk about RE Village and RE4 Remake, it got me thinking about a quick personal story that I thought I would share with you guys. Uh, first off, my name is Ulysses. I'm 26 and I've loved the Resident Evil series since I played RE1 on the original PlayStation. I played every game in the series, but had never played four since I didn't have a GameCube at the time. Since I missed out, I never felt like going back. That is until my daughter was born. My daughter was born on June 29th, a few weeks after Brian's daughter was born. I had a few weeks of paternity leave and plenty of long sleepless nights ahead of me, so I was looking for something new to play. Knowing Brian had just had his daughter and knowing how much he praised RE4, I decided to give it a try on my PS4. Needless to say, it is now one of my favorite games of all time, and not only is it a fantastic game, but it's also been a bonding experience that I share with my daughter. Now this past December, my wife and I had our second kid. It was a boy. I figured there was no better way to spend my late nights with them uh, than by replaying RE4 again. I, anyway, I, thank you. I love, if, I, yeah, I, I love a lot of that. I, I think it's funny to share that game with your daughter. If she's the there. same age as mine, that means she's very young. Um, but yeah, you know, they got to learn about dad, dad shooting the bad guys for weed eventually. Is it that's the moral of the Resident Evil story, I guess. Dad, <laughs> dad's, dad shooting bad guys for weed. Yes. Uh, anyway, before we come up with anything else uh, that Capcom will be mad about, I thought we could talk about uh, another <laughs> major industry uh, uh, company. The ESA. Uh, I wanted to bring up this week uh, a little bit earlier before we uh, recorded the show. Uh, we learned that the Entertainment Software Association, aka the ESA, has confirmed that E3 2021 will indeed be happening as some sort of digital event. Uh, the ESA provided a statement to IGN after VGC reported uh, the possibility of this happening. And the comment said, quote, we can confirm that we are transforming the E3 experience for 2021 and will soon share exact details on how we're bringing the global video game community together. We are having great conversations with publishers, developers and companies across the board, and we look forward to sharing details about their involvement soon. Uh, the, uh, according to VGC, which got into more detail that the ESA didn't confirm, the alleged plans for this new E3, uh, the, the, you know, the most recent and several revamps of the show, include having, quote, multiple two-hour keynote sessions from game partners in award show, a June 14th preview night, and other smaller streams from game publishers, influencers, and media partners. Uh, the broadcasting event would be preceded by a media preview week, kind of how it has been in years past, and demos would be released to the public during E3 2021 to help celebrate the future of video games. The ESA is also planning on making it, quote, possible to allow partner companies to remotely stream playable demos to the media across thousands of scheduled meetings alongside one-on-one -on -one assistance from devs. Uh, we had previously known 
EA was planning to come back in some form. They had mentioned, I believe, the dates of the 15th to the 17th. Uh, after they had closed the show last year, obviously, when EA was uh, shuttered last year and not happening in 2020, there was a lot of, you know, general chatter about, oh, when things are back to normal by E3 next year. Obviously, that is not the case. Obviously, there will not be an in-person E3 of any kind. Uh, we're looking at them doing a digital event in lieu of doing nothing as they did last year. Uh, they, they just skipped. But I, I sort of wanted to open it up. We've, we've talked a lot about E3 on the show before and sort of like the... The importance of E3, uh, this was even before, you know, uh, everything happened, obviously, but uh, even like two years ago when Sony was pulling out of E3, we talked about how important is E3 to the overall message in the yearly calendar of the industry? Uh, How much do fans and the industry and, you know, buyers and sellers rely on all this stuff? Now, a year through COVID, we are coming up on sort of the year anniversary of all of our shelter in place orders. Um, I... (laughs) one way to you know celebrate yeah yeah definitely i miss you all dearly um i i i just want to hear from you all sort of your thoughts about where e e3's place is especially now after we saw a year of companies doubling down on events ubisoft introduced the ub forward events obviously there weren't as many nintendo directs but playstation state of plays were happening uh all these different companies started doing their own uh, announcement series capcom just did the resident evil showcase we of course held uh our own show summer of gaming uh keely was holding his uh th- there were a lot of events in this last year that sort of uh spread everything out do we think everyone can come back together and have an e3 happen this year yes but why like what's the i don't, yeah. I don't know what the advantage is like if aside from them like uh, the ESA, as far as I can tell, has had, has never really had any uh, any curation for the stuff that come coming out of E3, aside from like coordinating the actual physical event space. So for them to be like, we're going to have a you know, we're going to have a big streaming experience. It's going to be crazy. It's I don't understand what's to stop publishers and studios from doing their own thing like we've seen Sony and Capcom and you know, Nintendo and Microsoft. I mean, we've seen everyone else do it. Like, I feel like the way we saw last last year shake out, what what is e, what does the ESA bring to the table aside yeah. from the, the letter and number E and three? <laughs> I think that, you know, it's it's interesting because on the one hand, I'm like, well, E3 has always been typically really uh, shouted off to consumers, um, you know, even when it was an in-person event, uh, which was a year ago or however long. <laughs> Time has no meaning. Um, but uh, they tried, and I never thought that it, it was a particularly good consumer show, right? I always like the lines were always like hideously long. People were queuing up for, for hours and hours for 10 minute hands on demos. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that people wanted to experience it as as an in person event, um, and I'm sure that there was a thrill that come that comes with that, and there is a thrill that comes with that, right? Like we've all been to an E3 and kind of felt that exhilaration. Um, but you know, publishers had been jumping off that ship like long before COVID, um, right. and 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 you know, around like the sort of 2020 time when when we were leading towards an E3 2020, like the pickings for that show were really slim. And I'm not really convinced that, uh, that people are going to come back, especially as you say, Dorno, like we've had so many and, and, and Max, we've, we've had so many different like places and spaces for publishers to share their message outside of that single show. I'm like mm-hmm. I'm 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 unsurprised that this is how the ESA are going about it, but I'm also like, it just feels dead to me, and I'd be really surprised to see it come back in some kind of cohesive form or anything like it used to be. It's it's right. reverse field of dreams rules. Like if you build it, they will come, but if you skip it for a year, they will leave and go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, the the genie's out of the bottle on this one. Honestly, like I feel like last year was their defining moment to sort of be like, this is what this looks like from home. And that's basically the the E3 is essentially like the, you know, the failing business in your city that wasn't doing great before all the other businesses got, you know, wrecked by by what was happening in the last year. Like E3 two years ago was a show that Sony didn't want to go to. Nintendo wasn't doing a live show out of anymore. Um, Most publishers were skipping or partying in the parking lot. Um, I mean, Bang Energy was there. You know, the guys that make the drink. So that's I guess that's what what people were looking for. But, you know, like Lucy said, it was trying to juggle this thing where they were like, we're this industry trade show, but we're also 
uh, like cosplaying as a PAX, but without any of the cosplay <laughs> and without any of the stuff that's, you know, d- designed for PAX. Like it, it wasn't it didn't work as a consumer show. It was dying in relevance as a uh, an insider show, a trade show. Um, and this is coming from someone that's been to a ton of E3s, loves E3, doesn't want it to die. But it it's I, I, I don't I don't see it coming back to where it is now. Once last year happened and they made the decision to basically skip a year and everyone said we can do this without them. Like one of the one of the details on on that on that on that post from them was that they're they're charging publishers six figures to to show off their games. Like if you look at this this wish list they put together, it sounds like something that like and I mean, with this, with all due respect, like a teenager would put together, like if he was like, this is this is what my dream conference would be like. Right. Like you, know, you can download the games instant. like it sounds like nonsense we've said on this show, which is a beautiful elevator pitch of like a company announces a demo and you can stream it through the cloud within seconds without ever having to wait in line. Like all that stuff is great. But like, I just don't see anyone being like, why? Let's go through them to do it. Like, there's no reason to have a middleman for this kind of uh, method anymore. If you want to get your message out, you just do it. And that's what that's what happened last year. We had, you know, six months straight of events and they would be on random Tuesday mornings or Thursday afternoons. So there'd be like a Nintendo Direct here and there that was announced uh, basically as it went live, you know, like this. It's chaos now, but I think for for people who want information all year, it's it's kind of a blessing. It's also wild that they're charging six figures because that's what they used to charge for floor real estate, right? Yeah. Like they would they, they would charge it for actual real estate on the show floor. And now they're charging it for what? Participation? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify, just in case anyone from the ESA is listening. I, that six figure thing, I believe, came from the the uh, the files that VGC has seen. So they they didn't say this themselves, but I, I think there's some basis there. VGC has a pretty solid uh, history of reporting on it. But yeah, I, I I just wanted to mention. I think it probably was like, oh, we've charged this before. We can charge it again. But yeah, like, what are the services? I, I agree with you, Brian. It's like taking out the middleman there's there's no real point to not just doing it yourself then and mm-hmm. i also imagine that they're you know they're offering all these services like oh it's on demand demos and oh we'll do all this stuff and this and, you know we'll have like the streaming it, it, I, I imagine it's still on the it's on the shoulders of the actual publishers to coordinate that internally it's not like they're offering like a turnkey solution to publicizing your game they're like you get to be part of our you know our live stream our clubhouse whatever i'm i'm a i'm a big fan of the way a lot of you know prestigious you know film film circuits and festivals have pivoted over the last year if you look at what sundance just did it's amazing like they basically said hey you can buy in for a day's worth of tickets you can buy in for the whole thing you can apply for a press pass or you can buy into individual movies and so like if you're reading some you know buzzy list of all this awesome you know five movies you have to see at sundance but you don't want to pay for the entire three-day trip or you know virtual trip you just buy movie tickets for those things and there's director q a's afterwards i think that there's like there's there's sort of like a more cohesive approach when it comes to film uh and i think with video games it's just inherently chaos and it's it's sort of because video games have a lot of moving parts and you can't just release a demo to the wild and let that be in the state that people see it. It's hard to get everyone to line up in unison for what E3 is. I also imagine that we have seen what was probably last year, the first time there was a break from, you know, publishers having to go pedal to the metal to hit that E3 press conference deadline and force them, their staff and their creative vision to make sure that they had a vertical slice playable or ready uh, to, to show off during that show. And last year, they probably said, wait a minute, we don't need to do that. Why are we playing by the rules of this one company when we can play by our own by our own? And, you know, the, we're having more and more open conversations about crunch culture and, you know, developers taking the time they deserve to make their games. And so why why shoehorn them into a, a creative, you know, a corner like that when they can kind of take their time and tell their own message whenever they want? Yeah, it's um, it's somewhat ironic and funny to me that last year after we were talking uh, about sort of all these companies then getting to make the schedules themselves, Sony was the one company that had an E3 week uh, showcase, of course. Yeah. Five. Um, but yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, that's a story that we've heard time and again of devs talking about like, 
oh yeah, we had to pivot, you know, development for X number of months or a year to make the E3 demo happen, or like a part of the team had to be working on that. I mean, just the recent uh, cyberpunk reports from Schreier uh, over at Bloomberg, Jason Schreier, were talking about how uh, so much of the what was built for the the demos that they showed a couple of years back were bespoke for that, and not necessarily mm-hmm. representative of what they were working on in the game. That that's a thing that we hear quite often. I'm still surprised that that was surprising to anyone. Like, yeah, I, right. I thought that 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 everyone knew that an E3 demo was made for E3. Like, yeah, that was the e, they called when we go and see them. Oh, this is the E3 demo, right? Yeah. It's primarily like a slice of gameplay made for that bespoke event. I it's was, very I was, yeah. I was just confused, you know. No, I, I, I thought that the, that the was, final product didn't wasn't indicative and and stuff, but like a lot of people yeah. were like the, the demo was fake, and it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, well, as much as any demo is fake before the game is released. There's been there's been this, uh, and I would say Watch Dogs, the first Watch Dogs is probably the first game to really kick this off on on the on the scale that it did. But there's been this very sort of like public scrutiny, justifiably so, of like the E3 demo versus the thing that you get at home. Um, but no, Lucy, you're totally right. I mean, I wish I wish that was more understood. But on the flip side, I wish it it, it that publishers and developers didn't feel like they had to mm-hmm. create this bespoke piece of content that doesn't necessarily uh, replicate the experience that the player will get at home because they're, you know, cramming to the finish line to get this thing done and ready for E3. I right. think that's a big that's a big problem, right? Yeah, and you, you hear these hellish stories, like behind the scenes stories, um, you know, often off the record stories about about developers who have crunched and crunched and crunched to get their E3 demo ready in time. And it's just, uh, you're right, it's something that needs to go away. <laughs> And then, you know, after all that, like Nathan Drake falls through the geometry live on stage and it, not he's not on stage, but he's on his own stage. Um, but, yeah, that's that, that was a big problem. I mean, that, and it's and, and then everyone in the in the audience is laughing and it's just like, what what is the value to something like that rather than like taking the time to get ready to tell your own story? I like I think that like the entire industry coming together for a one week event is awesome and it's important. And I think that's the thing that we're going to miss um, having that sort of scattershot approach to stuff last year, which like, especially for the, like the weirdest rollout for next for new consoles we've ever seen, um, you know, accompanied with a global pandemic and the sort of scattering to the wind of every single trade show uh, created a, I would say very unique scenario. I would like to see something come together again. I mean, we do have the game awards uh, and, you know, IGN had its summer of gaming, but that's, named after like a season right not not like it's it, it's like i we there were working on that show and i was like yeah i was like i don't even know when this ends right and so we were working on that show when we came out of the womb it feels like <laughs> i was gonna say we were working on it until it became the fall of gaming but um, some, some would say it had it's never ended it's an endless <laughs> summer of gaming it's but still I mean, happening I, as we speak I, I agree with you, Brian, in terms of I think there is something missing to one, the, the conversations that can happen, not just for like us to hear, you know, incredible stories about how these games get made, but for the connections that happen that do lead to the games that get made. Like right. it, it, at the end of the day, if there isn't an event like E3 that brings so much of the industry together, there is a chance for so many of those connections to be lost. But I, but on the other hand, I do one see the benefit of not having developers have to push for a demo that is released to a small audience that sees it and talks about it at this point um versus when these these teams can be just working on the pace that they need to be to finish the game uh, mm-hmm. and i like we will continue to see i think paxes will come back and i think gamescom will come back i will see those things but th- there's something about those other conventions both the ones designed for fans and the ones designed for press or for both that feel more certain to me than e3 coming back like Mm -hmm. i think you were all saying basically like the wheels were coming off the e3 wagon before last year happened whereas those other shows still feel pretty sturdy when we get back to things well there's there's the difference between the average convention feeling or being designed more like a party and e3 having press conferences which is very businessy you know i have to get up in front of the room and do a speech like that's not really a party to me like if i have to plan a powerpoint presentation for a party like that party kind of sucks unless i'm allowed to go completely stupid with it, which most companies aren't really allowed to unless you're a devolver which by the way keep making stupid you know <laughs> pdfs and powerpoints that's a good time um and so i think that's a problem right because it's like if you build your press conference around the concept that it lives and dies based on how well the press conferences are 
um, and then everyone pulls out of those things, then you're left really with a shell of what a show like that can be. Whereas PAX is just sort of like, we celebrate video games, we focus on indie games, we have cosplay. There's so many ways to make that work remotely. Um, PAX and has I don't think, you know, yeah. community centric first. Like that was a place mm-hmm. where people would go meet up with their online friends that they, you know, played games with. And there'd be, you know, there'd be, a, there's a board game room, there's a guitar hero room. And then you maybe wander around the show floor and play some little indie game. And it's, you know, it's getting an indie game on the show floor at PAX isn't, you know, prohibitively expensive, like getting it on the E3 show floor might be. Uh, right. Yeah, I, mean, I, through, yeah. I was going to say Gamescom uh, kind of on the flip side of that is somewhere between PAX and E3, but it's always been it's always been, you know, fan facing. And obviously there is like a there is a business side of it, a, you know, press side of it. But like uh, and they do have frequently press conferences attached to it. But it's also like the majority of the people who are at Gamescom are there because they want to like like their fans, like they want to participate yeah. in this in this thing that's been, you know, and it's also like that's a post Internet show. Like Gamescom started in 2009, which is we have some idea what that, you know, universe looks like. Like E3 started as a thing that, uh, you know, people who work for like Best Buy want to go to and check out what the hottest Nintendo games coming out in the fall of 1997 are going to be. Or people who write for GamePro and they're going to get some screenshots that they can put in a magazine that'll go on stands in three weeks. (laughs) E3 E3 started like as cave paintings. That's how ancient it feels. Like the fact that they were like. I remember like talking when I first started in this industry, talking to people who were like, I love E3 because I go there and a month later I have to write the articles about it for our magazine. <laughs> I was like, what? I, know, I was like, we're, I know. we're like live streaming on the spot. Like it's it's obviously so changed and different now. Um, but no, man, like Max, you're totally right. Like when you go to Gamescom, like there's this energy there because it is so fan fan focused and and specifically about letting thousands and thousands of people play video games that aren't out yet and it is designed for that there's all these like it almost feels like a theme park there's like those weird you know like uh zigzaggy lines that everybody's waiting in and recently like people are sitting in line playing switch there's like tons of food trucks outside you know there's cosplay areas there's there was like an entire like skate park downstairs one year like it is it just keeps going there's so many different things to do and see whereas e3 before you know in the last few years of being fan uh, tr- attempting to be fan focus they didn't really know what to do for fans like they were like we have a gift shop but it sells e3 t-shirts and it's like well pe- people are here for like nintendo swag they want like a you know like a, a, a foam vita keychain like they want they want like nonsense they can only get here and it, it just wasn't designed for that i think the merch and the messaging was so like indicative of e3's approach and like pax's approach for example so pax's messaging has always been you go to a pax it's like welcome home you know that's kind of the mm-hmm. messaging this is for the fans this is for the gamers etc cetera, etc cetera. i remember one of the first uh years i went to e3 when it was a, a fan show as well as a, a trade show you know they were selling t-shirts it was like yeah what of it i attended e3 2018 <laughs> and it's just like you know that that kind of like terrible like I was there, like, and that's very yeah. much kind of like the a kind of gatekeepery. You like, it's very elite. Yeah, um, and, I, and I, I hate, I hate that. I hated that approach to the fans. Um, it was like Facebook algorithm shirts. Were, it, yeah, it, that's right. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. My it's, boyfriend got me this shirt. He's really don't dangerous. don't yeah. mess with my uncle who's a right. gamer that works for Nintendo and yeah. has a toothache on National Toothache Day. Yeah, like. But no, Lucy, I, I totally agree with you as someone who like was able to you know finagle their way into E three via my like college newspaper years ago as my first time going and then getting to work at it with IGN. Like there, there was this allure and a, a gatekeeping nature to what E three was. And then I went to my first PAXs and was like, oh, there's something so different about this atmosphere, something so inviting. And I, I think that difference is also why I can sort of see the PAXs of the world and the Gamescoms living on in a way that I don't know if E3 can survive now. Mm-hmm. Um, but Brian, I just wanted to go back to a point you were saying of like, the, a thing we've talked about on the show in the past is everyone fighting for space within a single week. Like at the end of the day, we have seen Ubisoft gets their day with UB forward. WB got their day with the WB Thunder Fandom Thunderdome thing. Um, like everyone gets their day or week to be able to celebrate a thing. Dude, I can't to, the, see- to the point where like when one publisher goes like, we're going to take the year off. Somebody else is like, that's my chair. Yep. <laughs> like yeah, it, 3 p.m. I, on a Sunday. That's mine. <laughs> exactly. I can't conceive, especially the big players, especially Xbox, Nintendo, 
uh, and PlayStation, the EAs, the Activision saying like, oh, yeah, we will try to compete with everyone again in the same three or four day period when they don't have to for all of the biggest events. Like, I think that's last year, even if every show was differently successful and worked and didn't work in different ways, I think at the end of the day, they showed us all we don't need a single week for all as fun as it is like i'm not going to deny i don't i don't want the audience at home thinking like we hate e3 like we have talked about on the show we love being at e3 and the excitement of all those things at once but i think this past year especially has shown you don't need that to sell these games Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and so it is it's weird being on the precipice of knowing e3 is going to come back but we're going to see all these other digital events and who actually is going to show up at e3 is a really interesting question for me right now um that i don't look at the Go Look ahead. at the RE8 demo. Like yeah. that was that that would they picked a week that was like, eh, this is this seems good. This is you know in line with our schedule. Let's show off some cool new stuff. Let's announce that there's a brand new demo that you can you know check out if you want a PlayStation Five. And you finish that, and there's press X to pre-order the game. And like I mean, I remember seeing there were you know there'd be PAX demos where like people would wait in line for hours and hours, and they would go through and they'd check out the 10 minute demo, and then you know it'd be like we'll give you a T-shirt if you sign up to pre-order or you give us your email or whatever. And I don't know, you cut out all of that. Like you don't have to give out t-shirts. People are stoked they got to play a free demo. And it's right. and, it's all and they, it's all sort of have it now. Like <laughs> and it was at it was at, it was at the sort of tail end of a like 22 minute presentation that they just curated, scripted, put together. It had talking heads, it had gameplay, it had news of what's coming next. And they randomly dropped it in late January when they weren't competing with 600 other announcements. Like you have to you have to imagine that every publisher is looking at something like that and going like, why would we have to wait until this? Why would we have to pay a company to let us know that this is the time to tell people what we're working on? When no, I mean, even looking they can at, just do it themselves. When we did have a physical E3, uh, Ubisoft did that Tom Clancy Ghost Recon Breakpoint presentation that was like a oh, month yeah. before E3. And I think that was a really smart thing. To, I mean, that game obviously didn't pan out, but they had a very active, attentive audience because that was a you know, Wildlands had been a successful games as a service. They were like, all right, let's not compete with everybody else coming out of E3. I've, if anything, everyone's kind of, you know, mums the word until E3 and everyone's like mm-hmm. looking out for leaks. And then they were just like, hey, we got a 40 minute presentation. We're revealing bl- brand new gameplay. Tune in. Here's a countdown graphic. And I mean, we did like a pre and post show where we were like, what, what do you think of the guns? Was it cool? Can you climb that? <laughs> you know, like, you know, offering our expert informed opinions and whatnot. Uh, but like they completely owned the messaging there and they also yeah. didn't they weren't, you know, feeling obligated to like pad it out to be an hour long presentation or whatever the, you know, the structure required for to be an E3 press conference was. And then two hours later, EA didn't show Battlefield and they didn't have to worry about that. And right. it's, yeah, we're we're in that strange place where and just to bring it back within to the world of PlayStation, like obviously PlayStation had the PS5 showcase last year in the E3 week. They had a few state of plays throughout the year, but we're, we're at this point and I don't think uh, PlayStation or Nintendo or Microsoft is going to really wait for an E3 or a Gamescom to happen. Like they're just going to announce things now when they want to. We see Nintendo do that Thursday mornings. Every few weeks, Nintendo announces a new game or something on a Thursday morning at 6 a.m. And I wake up to Nintendo news. Sony Sony announces something the day after we record the show every few weeks like we're just going to get those things now week by week and there's an excitement to that there's a stress to that for our jobs but there's an excitement to that as well that I think permeates every week and then when they want to do a big blowout show they can do it when that timeline works for them and not because that timeline was predetermined 30 years ago by a show. Mm -hmm. Um, It's it's kind of like when you get old and like Christmas is not as great because you have enough money throughout the year to like buy yourself little things every time you're sad and you're like okay well i get like a hundred little presents a year from like a candy bar to like shoes or whatever i need to get myself and then christmas comes around and you're like oh you card like we don't have a big event anymore and it's kind of a bummer like e3 was video game christmas and it's probably gone forever as we know it and i hate that but also it probably had to go. I mean, well, I Sony I, Sony said, no, I'm not going to that show before everyone was like, oh, yeah, no one's going to that show. I mean, I was going to go the Christmas route, too, but I, I think it's more like a little advent calendar where, you know, you're all sort of like the end of the day. We're all looking forward to actually playing the games when they come out. But to have like these little things like, oh, I get to open up a little door and get a piece of chocolate from Capcom or, oh, like Ubisoft has a little, you know, a little picture of a bird nest or whatever. Or, oh, like, mm-hmm. I don't know, WB is showing off a new Star Wars Lego piece or whatever's in your freaking advent calendar. But like. At the end of the day, like the the, you know, E3 was sort of video game Christmas, video game Super Bowl. But it's also 
it, it's all like the the real the real reveal is playing the games like when we actually get them and they actually come out sometimes often on or you know playing them actually on christmas morning or whatever um totally and, yeah, and like yeah. I, honestly when it comes down to it the only thing we're really missing out on are the t-shirts and they weren't that great anyway. How I just want to say they what a weren't looked like. that I'm not wearing great. that on a big acid wash shirt, you know? <laughs> and, 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 for, and for a, a, someone of a slimmer build, like a like a woman or a slimmer kind of dude or anyone who is slim, you're, <laughs> those look terrible. They look like big, like it's like you're wearing a flag. They were terrible. <laughs> Well, hopefully there will be a time again <laughs> when we can all wear our oversized shirts to the JW Marriott Hotel Bar. Uh, but in the meantime, we can talk a little bit about uh, an announcement that may have come at some point during what may be the theoretical E3 2021, uh, because there's a strange continuing case that I want to bring up uh, briefly, as I do know there are some fans of the show, the, the game on the show. Uh, the longstanding rumors that Silent Hill will eventually come back. These appear probably as often as uh, Nintendo Direct rumors these days. I swear every week it's GTA 6 and Nintendo Direct and Silent Hill come up as rumors that we have to, you know, kind of glance at. But uh, the this past one was a little bit interesting. So essentially what happened here was uh, the Silent Hill composer, Akira Yamaoka, was on a, uh, a YouTube channel called either Al Hub or AI Hub. I can't determine if it's an I or an L. I hope it's Al Hub. I want it to I, be L. I hope it's Al Hub. <laughs> Uh, anyway, good old Mr. Hub was interviewing Yamaoka uh, about the medium, uh, as they were the composer of that as well. Uh, and they were talking to uh, the composer about other things they may be working on um, and said that there's specifically a project that they're working on and the announcement will likely happen this summer and said, quote, you'll probably hear something this summer to be announced. And I think it's the one you're kind of hoping to hear about. After that happened, the interview was then uh, taken down off of uh, Al Hub uh, and Al Hub said that it was uh, asked to be removed, uh, but didn't specify who was asking and apologized about that happening. Uh, then afterwards, Konami said we weren't the ones who asked Al Hub to take down the video, but uh, Al Hub basically said uh, that the removal request was from a third party that we are not able to disclose. Uh, all of this is to say, we we didn't get official confirmation of Silent Hill, but this feels like probably the closest of like someone who has worked on that franchise kind of leaning into the fan rumors about it. Um, yeah, Sony. And Jonathan, well, for, for somebody that didn't know if it was AI Hub or Al Hub like 90 yeah. seconds ago, you really went with the Al Hub thing with a lot of confidence. It's, like you, it's so you, good. I appreciate it. You said it like 40 Al times. It's really good stuff. Al Hub rolls off the tongue. <laughs> AI Hub doesn't really, it doesn't sound as good. It sounds like I'm mispronouncing like IHOP. Um, but anyway, I wanted to bring this up because uh, <laughs> Silent Hill is a subject that we haven't really touched on because some of these rumors, I, as someone who, you know, has had to look into them on the news side, a lot of them have quite frankly been a little bs but um having seen someone who is you know worked on the franchise before the constant for it the small mentions by konami that they haven't closed the door on this franchise seeing silent hill show up in games like dead by daylight and other things as dlc i don't i i feel like we are getting closer and closer to a silent hill remake actually happening and i guess one i want to read the temperature of the room of do we think he was talking about silent hill uh lucy i want to start with you I mean, uh, it, it could be possible, but we don't know what he deems the one that people are excited for. You know, exactly. he could be speaking to like an entire subset of weird niche fans excited about something completely different. Um, you know, I we haven't had a Silent Hill game since, what, 2012? Um, and I think that it is absolutely, over, we are overdue for a Silent Hill game. Um, the the cancellation of Silent Hills was one of the most crushing uh, cancellations in my uh, lifetime of like covering this business. Uh, it was so sort of soul destroying. I would love to see a remake of the first three games. Um, I would also love to see a new Silent Hill game, like an entirely new one. I would love to see it uh, return to not not that I don't think some of the Western developers working on that series. Um, didn't do a good job. I think some of the the subsequent games, once Team Silent bounced um, for you know various reasons, uh, I'm not sure that's ever been confirmed. But um, yeah, like I would like to see it go back to Japan. I would like to see a Japanese uh, studio tackle this. Um, it's 
it's an inherently weird, horrific, unusual franchise. I, you know, what they've done with Resident Evil in terms of like steering in, in terms of leaning into what made that so wonderful, um, but also modernizing it. I would love to see that happen with Silent Hill. Um, Silent yeah. Hill is, is, was always Resident Evil's weird, unspeakable sort of, you know, brother in the attic. Like it was just, it was a very, <laughs> very odd, terrifying series. I found it much more, much more frightening than, than Resident Evil. Um, but it leaned very much into Japanese horror. Like that was its very specific, uh, you know, lane. Anyway, I'm rambling now, but what I want to see is, yes, of course, I want to see a new, um, a new Silent Hill. I want to see a remake of the first three games. God, I would love to play the original Silent Hill with an overhauled engine. Um, and I also want to see a new Silent Hill under a visionary director. Yeah, the uh, I think you nailed it all. Um, I, I think you mentioned like the comparison to Resident Evil. Resident Evil, uh, besides constantly reinventing itself, is also, I, I think, really good at celebrating itself. Like if you look at the attention to detail they gave to Remake, which was at the time, and I would argue still today, one of the best video game remakes ever made. Um, and then what they went on to do with Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 3, probably less so as a good example, but still some really good stuff there. And then you compare that to the Silent Hill collection, which is the most recent and for most people only way to play a lot of those classic games, which is historically messy and not great and you know riddled with issues and glitches and you know uh, in in many ways like it, massive graphical downgrades like in in just removing so many of the sort of cryptic elements that define that series uh and that sucks and so i think first and foremost having a way for modern gamers to connect with that series on their current and or next gen previous gen platforms uh in a working matter is first and foremost the best thing they can do reintroduce an entire new generation like i look at what what they did with like crash recently where they were like oh yeah we're gonna remaster the trilogy we're gonna port the games we're gonna sort of celebrate that again and then we're gonna start making the new one um i think that's a really smart approach because this is a franchise that you know old folks like us love but if like you're young and you grew up watching like horror video games being streamed on youtube um you probably miss these and i want a way for modern gamers and old gamers to play these games again and i really really hope that's something they do and then open up the floodgates and you know start making new silent hill games again so go ahead max i'm looking at yamoka's wiki page here and mm -hmm. yeah there's a bunch of stuff he's done uh one thing worth noting is in 2022 uh apparently he's doing scoring for the anime series based on cyberpunk 2077 edge runners so i that also has a you know loud and active fan base though i don't know why that would result in the interview being taken down uh conversely the the P pt was a that was ps4 exclusive correct yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so i i would assume that somebody at sony noticed that people are pretty <laughs> excited about that and that like you know ps4s were going on ebay for like thousands of dollars and i feel like there, you know maybe there's some existing relationships in place there where somebody got someone else on the phone or emailed someone else and i could absolutely see this being a big playstation exclusive like they want to kind of pull that back in the fold and maybe you know i i, I can't i don't it doesn't really seem like konami really wants to throw money at um console games anymore like that's not really their jam uh they put out that weird contra couple of years ago or last year whenever that was which wasn't received very well but as far as like triple a stuff goes like that was kind of the seems like that was kind of the basis of their their um you know big messy breakup with kojima and mm -hmm. then they've continued to make you know pachinko machines and mobile games and they've always kind of gone to where the the profit is whereas you know sony's really leaning into doing first party stuff and you know short of um you know, having a, you know, a big, huge, like a, you know, scooping up a new studio or buying Konami entirely. I could very easily see them being like, hey, can we have that? Can we borrow that license? Can we buy that off of you? Like, we'll make the game. We'll foot the bill for that. You can have a cut of it. But like, you know, like that. I, I mean, I don't know how this stuff works exactly, but that <laughs> seems like a smart thing to do on their part. I think that's totally. how those business deals happen. I think they just say, hey, can we get a cut? And they're like, yeah, sure. Why not? But mm -hmm. no, I, I totally agree with you in terms of I like if you look at and we've talked about it before on the show, if you look at Sony versus Microsoft strategy, like Microsoft strategy has been acquisitions. Sony has acquired Insomniac in the last right. few years. Like that's really all they've done since I think Pixel Opus back in 2014, maybe uh, they, they tend not to really do acquisitions, but we have seen them do 
exclusive deals, whether it, it was Spider-Man before they bought Insomniac, Final Fantasy 16 is going to be console exclusive, Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo will debut as co- uh, console exclusives. Like that's what Sony does. And I wouldn't be surprised if they made a deal with Konami where it's like, you're not using this license. People kind of intrinsically right now think of Silent Hill because of PT and Silent Hills mm-hmm. as Sony related. Um the the silent hill creator you know recently left uh sony japan team but obviously there's still a history of that that franchise there i would not be surprised at all if if there is something in the works here and something sincerely credible to the build-up for all there's, of this there's one other possibility uh bokeh game studio which was founded by the silent hill creator uh and mm. is apparently working on a new horror title that will be released sometime in 2023 that Seems like an unannounced thing that could very easily involve Yamaoka. It also, I mean, now that, you know, Blue Point, you know, locked down Demon Souls a few months ago and it, you know, seemingly doesn't have any major next game announced. This is the one I sort of secretly want to will into existence. Like if they even if it was just the first game or the first few games, something like that, I do feel like there's something there. Um, like horror games are selling really well. They just are like people. There is this newfound affinity for them. Like I was talking about before about like the sort of like the 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 Twitch streaming aspect of it has like magnified how cool that genre is. That whole medium is um, for 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 telling horror stories and jump scares and stuff like that. And it's it's just totally right for that. And I really hope it that there's a way to make that return. It's tough because you do have that thing where it's like people there's a set of expectations that come with it. And like Lucy was saying, like it was heartbreaking to know that like we were going to get a full game like PT and honestly, personally, and I don't want to throw shade, but like for someone that didn't really like death stranding, the fact that that timeline split off and like the Kojima Norman Reedus game we did get was just like, like sad motorcycle dad. And he's just like collecting poop or whatever. Um, that that was just like that versus like just a like bleak first person horror game is like, damn, man, I wish we I wish I wish the universe had twisted that around a little bit and we had gotten that. But it is what it is. And people love Death Stranding. So no disrespect. Just personally hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you really feel about it, Brian. But no, it's, it was um, not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah, it, it is so strange, sort of like how events have led to this place where now Silent Hill is like one of the most rumored about games just because there there is that hole that was created by the cancellation of PT. Uh, and I think it's something that's been felt for a long time, both within the PlayStation audience, but just generally in gaming. I would not be surprised if we're, if we're finally getting towards something where this may be more of a reality. But um, yeah, it's, it is a strange and continuing thing to keep watching um, pop up and also to uh, have to occasionally email Konami and ask for comment about, and they're like, it's not dead but we're not announcing things. And it's so I was like, but is it going to be Pachinko? Just tell me, is it Pachinko? Yeah. Like what's, is it water bottles now? Like what are, where are we going next? But uh, hopefully, hopefully we uh, do get this announcement in the summer and it is actually Silent Hill. Obviously if it is, we'll be covering that on the show, but we're a, a few months away from that for now. Uh, so before that, uh, I do want to jump into uh, briefly what we're playing. Uh, I know we're just crossing the hour mark of when we're recording uh, behind the scenes has just turned to three. So if anyone has to go, I completely understand. Uh, just just wave your hand and let me know. But um, other than that, just briefly wanted to mention because the news broke on uh, Friday, but I don't think there's any of us who really play. Uh, Final Fantasy 14 is coming to PS5. There's going to be an, uh, a beta later this year. Uh, I'm strongly considering about playing when that beta comes out. So if I get sucked into an MMO later this year, I'll let you all know. Because um, apparently half the IGN staff is just secret Final Fantasy 14 fans I didn't know about. Um Later this week, apparently the fate of Anthem may be decided. Jason Trier had a report about this. I didn't want to linger too long because as this show typically does, I feel like we're going to go on about it for too long. And then the announcement will happen in between when we record. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, So we'll see what happens with Anthem as it goes on. Obviously, we know Bioware is also working on the Mass Effect Legendary Edition and a new Mass Effect and the new Dragon Age. So we'll, we'll see what they decide there. Uh, the we had a report from John Ryan from our staff. He he had spotted this and brought us uh, to Joe Scrubbles and myself about finding the Nemesis system from Warner Brothers essentially being patented. Uh, this patent is supposed to go into effect at the end of the month. Uh, I've seen a few devs uh, mention this on Twitter. I don't know if anyone has any brief thoughts about this before we talk about what we're playing. But the sentiment that I've seen is essentially... It sucks to patent something like this when game development is so iterative and people are 
working from inspiration of different ideas all the time. And now game developers who may have an idea like the Nemesis system now have to kind of worry if they're going to get into litigious territory about it. Um, yeah, I mean, all of the developers that I've seen talking about it think it sucks. Um, patenting like cool gameplay ideas just feels extremely gatekeepery and elitist and like not in the spirit of game making, but I suppose in the spirit of money making, right? And that's kind of a bummer. It's also like to patent a uh, mechanic that was introduced in an open world game that is otherwise incredibly iterative of of almost everything that came before it mm-hmm. feels like completely asinine to me this is not like they invented a new genre and a new set of systems and then implemented this the nemesis system and they were like that's so good that we got to keep it forever that's ours like right. they made what was I, I don't know like one of the top 30 open world games that were re- was released that year you know where like you follow blips on your map and fight the bad guys and then climb things to see more of the bad guys like that's uh, i'm being reductive here but like there's a lot of video games like that like honestly it's it feels kind of crazy to me that this this came out of out of a game like shadow of mordor which you know like is by and large a really fun game and i really really like it despite not really caring about lord of the rings that much uh but most of that game is is pretty, you know, you know, just r- running checkpoint open world video game stuff like and it does it really well. But the Nemesis system, which was unique at the time, and we all spent years theorizing everyone's going to steal this. Everyone's going to do something with it. No one really did. And now I think they will less than ever. So <laughs> it sucks. Yeah, no, I mean, that's like if they hadn't borrowed so heavily from various open world Ubisoft games, that game wouldn't have come out. And right well, if they were, they probably would have been able to borrow from the Arkham games for combat. But, you know, it's 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 bad. It's like a, it's a you know, it's it's it, it sucks. <laughs> there's nothing good about that. Yeah, um, there's yeah. no real upside to it. It's it's a strange thing. I mean, the upside for them is the money if anyone licenses it. But yeah, it's it, it is a strange, unfortunate thing to happen. And as you were all saying, you pretty much nailed it on the head. It only prevents it's gatekeeping and it, it'll it prevent other people from being able to iterate on this without having to, you know, spend money on licensing fees, which means, as we had said for years, like people should steal the nemesis system and no one ever really did. And now probably even less people will consider doing it. I hope point. someone steals it, but they do. They do the opposite and they make like the paramour system where like a oh. random NPC, the more you encounter them, the more they have a crush on you and they'll just keep Ooh. showing up and like bringing you, I don't know, bouquets and stuff. That's that's a visual novel in the making. I feel like you've really. I'm trying yeah. to th- I, there's actually there's like a couple of games like that where like you when the more you interact with a character like I mean like that's how you tame horses in a lot of games right yeah I mean well, that's yeah. <laughs> persona you basically spend time you choose what friends to spend time with and then you get to romance them but yeah I mean like a, a system like that where it was random characters in the world honestly would kind of work for persona six if it was like different kids uh at the school when you're like flirting I, with everyone I think they should I, still be it. orcs and goblins <laughs> No. <laughs> I think you're lovely. I'll see you later. We can hang out. <laughs> and they go running off behind some grog or whatever. Orcs need love too, man. Um, I, I did want to obviously. I'll when... see you in court. What are you doing this weekend? Let's have a good get together. <laughs> Notice one of your enemies remembered your name. I huh? time to pay up. <laughs> anyway, Max, what have you been <laughs> That hurts. Um, I have that. been. Uh... <laughs> Chipping away at you. <laughs> I've been playing lots more Hitman. Uh, I love it so dearly. I told myself I would not uh, jump into Hitman 2 until I, you know, sort of earned my keep in Hitman 1 and 3. And I jumped into 2, and 2 is so good. All of those games are so good. I love them so dearly, but I've talked about those extensively. Uh, I'm also playing um, a little bit of Little Nightmares 2, which is uh it, it's more of what I loved about the first one. It feels like playing a really, really deeply upsetting children's book. Um, and it has the same. That's out today, of, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's out this week at some point. Yeah, let me check. Um, yeah, I played a little bit of it too, and I, I'm totally with you there. I really dug the first one, and this feels like more of the first one, which is not a bad thing because I that game was like three hours long. So mm-hmm. uh, I'll, I'll happily take more of it. There's at least so far, I don't know how far into it Max you are. I'm not super far, but there's a little bit of combat that I was doing, like very basic, essentially, like you get one hit against an enemy. I, I found occasionally, depending on like the framing of the scene, it would get a little too precise. And I was mm-hmm. dying not because I was bad at it, but just because I couldn't really read what I was doing. Yeah, um, I've I've definitely had that. I, I feel like it's something that I both enjoy, but also get frustrated with because compared to yeah. something like what Playdead does with their games, which are incredibly like 
just precision airtight and just like like you die in like one screen and there you're like half a screen over and it's like totally perfectly checkpointed and everything's beautifully animated and this is gorgeously animated too but again like you said like you sometimes you like you ran too close to the foreground or you weren't in exactly the right spot and you get you know killed by a horrible man or whatever (laughs) but yeah the uh the adult designs like essentially the the big characters that are hunting you are you know just what i wanted of like the weird creepy spookiness there's one character i've encountered so far who's she can basically like extend her neck like a snake and you know try and find you around like different corners and stuff it's creepy and gruesome and disturbing on so many levels that i'm enjoying exploring more of this world but yeah it's definitely it, it's not like breaking new ground with that franchise but if you like the first it feels fans of the genre will probably like it more um brian what about you have you been playing anything new in the last week since we spoke nothing really new uh i'm running through re4 on pro mode which i realize like i really like but um they do a really stupid thing in that game where they make the like qtes harder on pro which means you just have to just mash x faster which is stupid and I hate that. Luckily, a lot of companies don't do that anymore. Um, I'm also playing the medium, which is on Xbox. I've just been kind of I'm, I'm always like on a horror kick at the beginning of the year or really most of the year, but specifically like January, February, March. I always watch a lot of horror movies. And so, um, yeah, that's that's over there. It's on Game Pass. Check it out. And then I did play a bunch of Greedfall, which I'm enjoying. Even though it's kind of slow and a little bit tedious, but I dig it. You grabbed it from a PlayStation Plus. Yep. I figured. Yeah. Um, yeah, I still need to jump into that one at some point, but I, that reminds me, I did jump back into, I forget if I mentioned it last week, but I did start, uh, cause I want to check out the PS5 patch. I started playing God of War, even though I've replayed that, you know, um, or love that and reviewed it. Uh, and it's, I'm, I'm continuing to play it in small chunks and it's been this nice little just thing to revisit for like an hour or two at a time and, and continue going back through that world. It's still, it's still so good. I love that game so much. Um, uh, Lucy, what about you? What have you been playing? Uh, I won't go on about it because we have talked to death uh, about Hitman. But yeah, I'm playing Hitman 3 and Hitman 1 concurrently. Um, so I'm kind of getting mixed up as to which levels are in what. But uh, it's, 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 cra- it's crazy fun. What's, I, your favorite, you know, what's your favorite map? Well, I'm not finish them enough to say that uh but i really like that i really like the second the second level in hitman 3 where you um well i don't want to spoil it it's you know the one where it's like you're in the, the gardens the mansion yeah the mansion. is it dartmoor yeah it's dart it's dartmoor yeah. Yeah, I love that one. You're not, yeah. you can't, you're not spoiling it by being like it's in a mansion like it's in, <laughs> it's in the trailers <laughs> It's, well, that one, that I, one made I, me feel very like James Bond, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, that one's great. It's funny. I've heard that, like, when we were covering the game, it was sort of a thing of like people sometimes don't want to know the location. Granted, saying a mansion, I don't think tells you too much. But yeah, there, there is. That, that's, I guess, what the story spoilers are there. Since the story is, I, I have no idea what's going on in the story. I'm still playing, like, uh, replaying levels over and over, and I have no idea what I'm doing story wise. But I'm still having a blast with the game. I will say, uh, look out because Max and I will be doing like a big live stream of this game soon for uh, this. Uh, and um, I want to tease anything, but I think uh, I think I might get a bald wig. Just in the game or in real life? Oh, real in life. real life. OK, I'm going to barcode time. tattoo on the back of my head. See, apparently you can go wherever you want with those. No one cares that the man with the barcode tattoo is just walking around. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's totally normal. I mean, I feel like if you see like if you're walking into Walgreens and you see a guy walk in with like a shaved head and a barcode tattoo in the back, you're like, he's going to rob the place. <laughs> I think if you scan it, it probably brings it up for uh, for like scalp polish or something, because he probably right. buys so much of it. He goes into like Walgreens and he's like, just that's true. You there. get you do get 25 percent off of Cheerios. <laughs> I, I, I like the thing is with the barcode tattoo is like it really feels like a product of its time. Like I was yeah. this close and I swear this close to getting one of those like early 2000s um barbed wire armbands right Ooh. and i i feel that the that the barcode is as of its time as the as the armband like it mm-hmm. is it feels very like i see him i see this polish game i'm playing on a ps5 it's just like mwah, 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 chef's kiss and then like he turns around and it's like what that feels like it's from another era i don't have a problem with it have but a tramp stamp you know yeah I personally don't have a problem with it because I like my, my entire back is uh, zeros and ones from the matrix. Of course. Just like going down like that, which I think is aged 
miraculously. And then it says enter the matrix right at the bottom of or the top of my ass. That's your, that's your tramp stamp is enter the matrix. I like yeah. to think that agent 47 has just an enormous QR code tramp stamp. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like all of his personal information. And he's like, I, no, love- I can't let anyone go back there. Uh, I was just informed by HR that we broke the record for a number of times uh, saying tramp stamp on a podcast this year. So I have a congrats. tramp stamp, by the way, just <laughs> for everyone's info. Congrats. Learning a, learning a lot about you that. that terrible, I didn't know. terrible era. And just- I'm trying to think of if I had to get it, like, what, what's the most egregious tramp stamp I could get that would be on brand? And it would probably be like a like Kingdom Hearts fanfic. Photo Close. I have a friend from art school who has a tramp stamp of Lady and the Tramp or tramp oh. from Lady and the Tramp. So it's very it's a very literal. literal I mean, it's like stamp. it's 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 mildly amusing for a lifetime of pain. It's fair. This is a, anyway, this, is, that- this is a good time for leg tattoos if you're trying to get no one sees that part of your body anymore <laughs> if you work from home. So <laughs> do it up. Oh, no, the show stopped recording. Everything went wrong. It's fine. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> no, anyway, uh, thank you all for letting me know what you've been playing, what tramp stamp, tramp stamp you've been considering. Uh, before we wrap up, I did want to read a couple of memory card stories. Uh, we've gotten some great ones in. Reminder, you can write in with your stories to beyond at IGN.com with the subject line memory card. This first one comes from Michael. Michael said, first time running into Beyond, I started listening back when Max and Brian would start the show off with an endless exchange of Beyonds. That Max was that, that was that was him and Andrew. I didn't have anything to do with that. You <laughs> loved that. You always said I love it so much, and you you were never visibly annoyed. <laughs> always the happiest one to happen. Anyway, I grew up in the Philippines. Michael continued writing, where video games were at least twenty five times your average meal. So, needless to say, console gaming was quite a luxury. I grew up where console rentals by the hour were more common than friends having a console at their home. My friends and I would scour the town for these video game shops that became our local community of gamers, similar to how arcades probably function. I would remember going as early as the break of dawn because the queues would get so long at these shops that it would take a while for you to turn uh, for your turn if you came in in the middle of the day. It became a great experience because of the amount of friends I met and games I played because they had a wide array of games, which I only realize now are mostly bootlegs. Uh, but now I live in New Zealand and uh, consoles are more common here. Hey, and I get, I get to own my own and now share it with my five-year-old son who probably doesn't realize how lucky he is. Uh, stay safe and more power to you beyond from Michael. Uh, thank you, Michael, from uh, your memories of uh, growing up at, I, I, I never really had arcades in my town. So I never really had like shared like gaming experiences with like people. It was often just like a friend would come over and play games. Mm. Um, I feel like I missed out a bit with that, but. Uh, Anyway, the other memory card story we have for today comes from Sean. Sean wrote in and said, back in my teens, I was enjoying playing my favorite PlayStation game, Metal Gear Solid. I had defeated Psycho Mantis and was aimlessly running down a corridor when the screen froze and the words controller disconnected came up on it. Puzzled, I thought, here we go again. Mantis must have survived and is playing more tricks on me. (laughs) It wasn't until I looked down that I noticed my controller wire was in two halves and our house rabbit sat looking up with me with what I swear was a smug look on its face. Another one of Psycho Mantis's tricks. <laughs> Destructive he, hair, the secret member of the <laughs> Shadow Moses. What, the, what are they? <laughs> Dead Cell or whatever? No, that's the uh, one. As you can imagine, I wasn't too pleased with now having to fork out for a new controller with my pocket money. However, that evening I did have a scrumptious meal of rabbit stew. Only joking. They didn't. They didn't do that. They just wanted mm-hmm. the surprise. I <laughs> Psychopathic yeah. uh, little. Yeah. Yeah, went real dark. <laughs> that would have been quite. Yeah, like if that was played straight, that would have been real dark. Uh, no, they went only joking. It would never. Anyway, love the podcast. And thanks for all the laughs, Sean from the UK. Uh, I would eat rabbit stew. That sounds good. Why wouldn't you eat it? I mean, I, the idea of killing it because it ate your control. Afterwards. I mean, I don't know. Do what you got to do. I'm sure like if, if you're if you're like really stealthy until the very tail end of a mission and then you have to just like arbitrarily kill like 18 dudes in a row, I think you probably get the ranking of like bare, very bad rabbit. Or like terrible bunny or whatever. Terrible. Like that's mm. uh, you just get a Donnie Darko costume for the rest of your game. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for writing. And if you want to share a story with us about your PlayStation or gaming past, please write in to beyond at IGN.com with the subject line memory card and we'll read them on the show this week. Uh, with that though, that is pretty much going to wrap us up for this week's episode. Uh, before we sign off, just wanted to ask you all uh, of something cool you've been watching or listening to or reading. Uh, Max, I'll start with you. Uh, I've been reading a bunch of Harlan Ellison short stories. He's one of the old sci-fi authors who's been, uh, I would say, hugely influenced Fallout a lot. But um, very weird, very weird. Like uh, just uh, they they all have great names, too. Like I have no mouth and I must scream, which is um, 
yeah, I would say required reading for anybody who's trying to dig into 20th century sci-fi where they wrote most of the science fiction. <laughs> uh, like nice. Jules Verne or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brian, what about you? Uh, I've been on a really big Junji Ito kick. I just finished um, a couple of his books. I just finished his newest one, uh, Ramina, which is about as close as you can get to Junji Ito doing cosmic horror, which I totally dig. Um, yeah, outside of that, just been watching a lot of spooky, scary movies, um, mostly about um, Earth exploding and stuff. Just bad fun, you know, fun stuff for the whole family. So Real things are going well. Yeah. The yeah. Bright, bright days ahead for all of us on trying National to stay upbeat. <laughs> uh, and Lucy, what about you? Um, I just want to plug a podcast that I have been obsessed with for the last year. And it's actually kind of really helped me get through uh, this lockdown. It's called Evolution of Horror. It's by uh, held, heralded up by a guy named Mike Munzer. Uh, he's a British dude. Basically, what he does is he charts just that, the evolution of horror through its various genres and subgenres and dissects them with the various guests each week. But he's he's a really endearing guy. The com- like the guests he get he gets on are incredibly um, learned, well versed, funny. Uh, it is just such a fantastic podcast if you're if you're a fan of horror and it's it's so it's like there have been so many episodes now that you can kind of like choose which kind of genre you want to jump into, choose the, the films that you want to um, hear more about and hear discuss. Uh, it's just such a fantastic podcast. So yeah, please check that out on Spotify and various other podcast platforms. Cause I, I, it's, I, again, it's got me through this year. That's awesome. Lucy, I, I didn't know that one, but I'll have to check it out. Brian, go ahead. Sorry. Lucy, you and I have both guested on a, uh, horror podcast that we should shout out to. Oh yeah. I don't know if my episode is out yet, but I have recorded an episode and that's a nightlight horror, um, the horror movie podcast, right? Mm-hmm. Nightlight um, with a cat, with a, with a K on the night. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of bloody disgustings, uh, network of podcasts. Uh, Prince Jackson is the guy who runs that. He's fantastic. He's, um, again, just super, uh, informed about horror, uh, great discussions, very passionate. And I love that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm talking about horror. Like I love it when the other person is as passionate as I am. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah that's rules. a great one to listen to as well. Awesome. Uh, and yeah, I guess something for me, because I, I realize I kind of watch it every week, but I've, I've been going back more to it uh, more and more because it's just sort of a, a literal comfort food thing for me. Uh, I've been watching a lot of a YouTube channel called uh, Sorted Food. It's these uh, five guys out of the UK. Uh, two of them are actual chefs. Three of them, they call themselves normals. Uh, and basically, it's sort of like they've been friends for, you know, a decade plus, And it's kind of about their journey of learning to cook and eat more uh, healthily, more consciously about the world and just... Uh, also ha- get up to wacky cooking high drinks uh, in their studio. Uh, but in particular, they have a series called Pass It On, where essentially it's like a game of telephone, but cooking. And so each of them takes 10 minutes to start a meal and then the next person comes, but they can't talk to each other in between and they just have to figure out where to bring the meal from there. And then Ooh. at the end, of it, then at the end of the, you know, 50 minutes or whatever, they decide whether or not it was a pass or fail. It's always hilarious. It's never what they plan from the start. Like, it's it, they go in different orders each time it's based on different ideas different themes and everything it's a really really funny series they have at least i think like 20 or 30 episodes so definitely watch that if you do they uh, know what the food is or does it just show up and there's just like some kind of meat in a bowl with wet stuff on it and you're so like, hey. at the beginning it, it's normally like okay the theme this week is you're going to be cooking um you know what your ideal comfort food is like when you think of comfort food cook you, you have to go into this with comfort food and then the first person will go in and they have essentially like you know a huge amount of food at their disposal from like stuff they bought to prepare for other uh, shoots and stuff they have all that food laid out for them they start cooking and whatever they've done in 10 minutes that's just there and going and the next person usually you know they might want to continue that but they don't have instructions or anything you can't like write down what you're doing in in full notes so they either pick it up or then just make it up as they go and start something new um it's it usually leads to catastrophe but it's very funny um anyway other than that that is going to pretty much wrap us up for this week's episode of podcast beyond thank you all so much for watching and or listening we're normally live wednesdays at 3 p.m pacific at beyond.ign.com youtube.com slash ign beyond and your favorite podcast services around the world you can find us on twitter i'm at jm dornbush brian is at agent bizzle lucy is at lucy brian and max is at max scoville uh thank you all so much for joining me for this week's episode and thank you as always to red our producer for helping make the show happen uh anyway we hope you're all safe and doing well out there and as always Beyond. Beyond. Beyond.